Hello again, it's great to have you here listening to another episode of the ABBA Podcast with me, John McDonald. You can follow us on Twitter, just search ABBA Podcast and you'll find us. Or connect with us through Facebook on the ABBA Podcast with John McDonald page. You can download the episodes from iTunes, Google Podcasts, Podbean and TuneIn. Hopefully we'll soon be with Spotify and a few others too. In this episode I want to talk about the secret place. You know there's a secret place for each and every one of us that's already been made ready. You don't have to press in, you don't have to fire in, you don't have to fight to get there. It has been made ready for you that just waits your arrival. So, the secret place. I've heard and read so many things about the secret place. Most of the things I've read and heard, not everything, but but much of what I've heard, what much of what I've read about the secret place, talks about accessing God to learn his secrets or to receive revelation that's hidden or, or power or, or a greater anointing to minister. And, and it's almost like it's been set forward as a place to go and, and make a reputation for yourself. Is that really what the secret place is all about? In 2013, my wife and I went to Israel. We spent a week snorkeling at Elat. And then after some great days there, we reluctantly had to leave. (laughs) But we drove up past the Dead Sea uh, and spent 24 hours in Jerusalem. And I mean, an amazing city. I was a little bit sceptical. Before I, I went to Jerusalem, I thought, well, it's going to be a kind of tourist rip-off and, and all the marketing and everything else. And there were bits of that. But actually, there were some great highlights. Um, and it was, was wonderful to be in the place where, you know, Jesus walked around, you know, in the old city and the Mount of Olives and everything else. And amongst those highlights for my wife was Gethsemane. As we walked around in there, there was a pastor um, sharing with some people the passage from Jesus in Gethsemane and, and it just really impacted her to hear that. He was speaking in French, my wife loves French and so she was able to listen to a little bit of what he was saying and it really, it made Gethsemane her favourite spot on that trip in Jerusalem. For me, yeah, it was, it was nice but there were other spots that impacted me in a different way. Up in the Mount of Olives, uh, we walked up early one morning just to avoid the crowds and not go up the main road. And we stood in the steps and looked out and thought, wow, is this? Where, did Jesus stand here? Did he look out over the city like this when he, he cried out over her? We can only speculate. But at the top of the Mount of Olives, there's a, a place called the Church of the Paternoster. And it's part of a Carmelite monastery. And all around the walls of this place and the gardens are plaques and tablets in which is written the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And this prayer is inscribed in all of these plaques in different languages, uh, more than 300 languages there. I saw Cherokee, I saw Maori and Aborigine, I saw Hindu, as well as the European languages and others. And they had a little chapel in that place, a beautiful, peaceful spot. And when we went in, the presence of God was so strong. We both just looked at each other and we knew people pray in here. People meet God in this place, just as we were meeting him. It wasn't a tourist trap like the Ascension site next door and some of the other spots. It was a place where he knew This wasn't primarily for tourists. This was primarily for praying and meeting with the Lord. And it was just a beautiful place to sit in. We sat there for a little while until other tourists came in and began chattering loudly and taking photographs and basically disturbing the peace that was there. (laughs) And But we valued that experience very much. The other spot for me that was... Uh, a wonderful place and really captured me was the garden tomb 
it's a a place run by a, a British non-profit charitable organisation. And when you step into it, you step through it into a space that's, it's not a huge, huge space, but there's room to stroll around and not necessarily keep bumping into people. <laughs> there is a, a garden with a little grove in it. Uh, to the left of that is the tomb. Uh, at the other side of the garden is a place to, you can sit, a covered area, and look out. And there's a, a rock face there, which many believe to be the original Calvary, which would be at the, the limits of the old, the old city. Uh, and the face of it actually does look like a skull of sorts. You can almost see like eye sockets and nose socket. and So I can understand why people think that that could be Calvary. But um, after seeing that and, and wandering into the tomb and spending a few moments in the tomb, um, I wandered into this little grove that was in the, the garden area and instantly began to weep. I wasn't sobbing, but tears came and because... As I entered, Father was there. He met me. Just almost as though he'd been waiting for me to complete the little tour that I was doing and come into his presence. And so as I sat there in his presence, there was just tenderness and peace and rest and I could just, I could only weep. I wasn't breaking my heart, sobbing, but but I was was weeping. And at that moment, I didn't want anyone else or anything else. It... I was in the place where I belonged and felt accepted and affirmed and felt significant. And both of those spots were memorable for me, not just because they were beautiful spots, which they were, but because of the experiences I had there in meeting with the Lord. And so many of us, we have our favourite spots in the world, don't we, because of the memories associated. We've had encounters there. We've had fabulous holidays they're, they're like our own secret places. Even if people, other people know that they exist, we like to think of them as our places because we met someone special there. We had a, a memorable experience. Perhaps it's even a, a, a church or a sacred place. But there is nothing actually special about those places in and of themselves. The places don't hold any magic. What is special is the experience that we have had in those places. And many of us think that the experience can never be found anywhere else and we lose the magic of possibly having that experience in other places because that one experience has become so intricately linked with the place where it took it, it happened, where it occurred. You know, I could look back on my trip to Israel and live the rest of my life remembering Israel and wanting to return to the garden tomb so that I can repeat that experience. But the chances are that experience won't be the same because the experience was never actually about the place where I stood or I sat. The experience I had in the garden was was because of the condition of my heart. My heart was in a a very receptive place. I was thinking about Bible stories, about Jesus, his tomb, his resurrection and being in this land where he actually walked. And so I was in this spiritual state of vulnerability And it just made it so much easier for Father to meet me there. And in our spiritual lives, the secret place is not a physical space. It's a spiritual realm where we meet with God the Father. And when people spoke about the secret place and meeting God there, I I struggled in the early years of being a believer because it just seemed so ethereal and so up there. I couldn't relate to it. I couldn't grasp it. I couldn't see it. And I was left feeling as though I just wasn't spiritual enough and these people were so way ahead of me. But as I've been living in this place, I've been loved by Father. As I have learned to rest in his presence and receive his presence, I uh, begin to walk in his presence, I am understanding more about the secret place and how to dwell there. And I, I just want to share a little bit with you in this podcast about what I've learned so far. I by no means know everything And I'm sure there are people who have dwelt in the secret place far longer and in a deeper sense than I have. But I just want to share with you what I've learned so far. And I hope it will be of help to you on your journey. And I want to start in the scriptures. In John chapter 14, Jesus is sharing his last moments with his friends and his followers. They've just had that supper, celebrating the Passover. And now 
Jesus begins his final discourse. He, he begins to share his final words. And we see that over chapter 14, 15, 16, 17 of John's Gospel. But I want to begin in John chapter 14, verse 1 through verse 3, where Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And I, like many others, have had images of mansions and castles being built for us in in heaven. You know, that's the picture that Father's house has conjured up. Some people think of, I don't know, perhaps you think of some heavenly Hilton, (laughs) of some luxury hotel. But, you know, we have these images of places we live in, in streets of gold and everything else. And although Jesus uses a word that can actually mean a physical building, he's more properly speaking about the household of God. He's speaking about Father's family. He's telling his disciples that no one will miss out from being included in the family because there is enough room for everyone. All peoples are welcome into this household, into this family. You know, a building, a physical place has restrictions. There are boundaries, there are walls, there are rules and regulations. People put fences around things. But Jesus is saying that within the household, within this family unit of God, There is flexibility, there is room for expansion and adaptation for increase. And so there is no limit in the household of God. Because this household is not measured by its walls that contain the people. It is measured by the people who are a part of it. And so that people group, that family is always expanding. And so Jesus could say, there is room, there is plenty of space in my Father's household for everyone. And I'm going to make a place for you in that household so that you can be where I am. He promises that he's returning to his Father to make space for each one of us so that where he is, we also will be. He's promising that we will share that place he has with the Father. We will dwell in that place with him. And this is just one passage where John speaks about, uh, where, sorry, where Jesus speaks about Uh, where he came from, where he emphasises the fact he's returning to the place he came from. He's not just going into the grave and rotting, but he is returning to the place he emerged. And in John 13, verses 1 and verse 3, we read that it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. In John 14, verse 28, we read that Jesus saying, You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. In John 16, verse 28, Jesus says, I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. In John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus says to Mary in the garden, Do not hold on to me. For I have not yet returned to Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and and your God. And I love that, that Jesus is, he's spoken throughout the whole thing about his Father. And now he says in the end, I'm returning to my Father and your Father. That is wonderful. He's emphasised where he's come from and where he's going to now. But what? Did it look like? What was that place that Jesus came from? What was his existence in eternity with God his Father? What did it look like? Was it sitting on a throne at God's right hand, proudly reigning? Or was it, as some people like to think, Jesus in subjugation to his Father, bowing down before him constantly? What was it like for Jesus to spend eternity, as the NIV says, at the side of God? John Chapter 1, verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And I think that the use of that language, at the Father's side, is a bit confusing because we have that picture of Jesus sitting then on a throne and leaving this place of, of great honour and majesty to step into this world full of its pain and its horror. But I'm not sure that 
the use of English language adequately describes what Jesus is speaking about when he speaks about dwelling with his Father, coming from the Father's side. You see, Jesus came to reveal what the Father is like. We've limited Jesus' mission in our our gospel preaching to dine on the cross, but that was not Jesus' purpose. That was a result of fulfilling the purpose. His purpose was to reveal the true nature of God his Father and reconcile lost humanity to him. That's why John says, No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. John states at the very beginning of his gospel the purpose Jesus had in coming to this earth. And it's only possible for Jesus to reveal the full, true nature of Father if he was in a deeply intimate place and relationship with Father in the beginning. I really believe it's important to understand this because whatever it was like for Jesus at the Father's side is what our dwelling place is like. It's what Jesus is preparing for us and leading us into. He said, wherever I am, you also will be. Whatever Jesus' experience was before he came to earth and whatever experience he's returning to is what he's inviting us to experience with him. And so I think it's important for us to understand, to know what kind of relationship with Father Jesus is describing and envisioning for us. And this word translated side that the NIV use, a couple of other translations use it, it's the word kolpos. It's often referred to, uh, used to, sorry, to refer to a bay or a cove in the in the sea, in the coastline, where the, a body of water there is sheltered. Uh, it's used to describe the fold in someone's garment, where they would gather loose material at their their breast in a pocket, as where they could then insert something precious, or in their lap where. They could pull the material up over their belt and it would hang loosely again like a pouch where you could keep valuables in. Many of the versions of the Bible don't use the word side to translate kolpos. They use the word bosom or breast or heart. And according to the concise Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament, um, kolpos in the New Testament always refers to special social status which you gain through personal contact with an important individual. So when John is, is preventing us, presenting us sorry, with, with Jesus, he's presenting us as someone of great social status because he comes from a place of personal and intimate contact with the most important person in the universe, God, our Father. He's come from the colpus of God, the folds of God's own garment, this place of intimacy at the very bosom of God himself. It can also, this word kolpos can also be used generally just to mean the space between someone's arms. You know, imagine a little child crawling onto their mother or their grandmother's lap, leaning against them. They lean into their chest and nestle their head in that little hollow between the shoulder and the neck. And very often we'll see mom or, or, or grandma wrap their arms around them hold them securely, perhaps wrap their cardigan or or a blanket or coat around them and just create a little cocoon where the, the, the child is protected from the outside world. They're in a place of safety, security, quiet, peace and rest, listening to the heartbeat of their, their guardian. They're protected, they're loved, they're affirmed, they're welcomed. They're, they're in the place where they belong. They are in that culpus. And so Jesus is saying, I came from that place, that cocoon of intimacy and safety, protection, affirmation, nurture, belonging. And I'm returning there. I'm returning to this tremendous place of intimacy to make a place for you. I left it to come into this hostile environment in the world. The the tension in Israel between the Israelites and the Romans, between the religious and non-religious, between the rich and the poor. And I'm returning to that place of safety, to prepare a place for you, that you might be where I am. And so when we read these statements from John's Gospel about Jesus coming into the world, leaving to return to the place he'd left, this is what he's describing. He's describing this place of intimacy and security and comfort and peace and rest and belonging. And so when we we realise this is what he's talking about, we can begin to understand more deeply what it is Jesus died for us to have. 
It wasn't just forgiveness. It wasn't just a place in heaven. It was to sit with him at the colpos of God and the folds of God's own garments, to, to be embraced to the breast of the Father and share that place with Jesus himself. The gospel is not limited to just going to heaven. It is about now enjoying the presence of our Father and dwelling in his embrace. This is not a future promise. Jesus is speaking about where I am, not where I will be. And he's saying this place has been prepared now that he's returned to Father, so it's something we can access now to encounter and experience the love of the Father, his presence affirming us and comforting and nurturing us. And I believe that that experience of dwelling in that place, that place of being loved and comforted and nurtured, that is the foundation of Christian living. Everything about being a Christian comes out of that experience of being in the place where Jesus is in Father's colpos. And unless we can learn to dwell there, I think we will continually struggle to live the life he created for us. The rules and regulations of religion don't provide that kind of life. Because that is a life of striving, of effort, and there is no rest in it. That's why these are the burdens that Jesus spoke of. It's why he said in in Matthew's Gospel, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. In other words, I will show you to the place at the Father's bosom where you can find that peace that religion and striving and effort doesn't bring to you. And the way of life that God has designed for us is to dwell with him in the embrace. It's not a doctrine, it's not a theory, this love. It is a spiritual reality, it is a, it is a, a substance, a spiritual substance that enables us to rise above the pettiness of this world. It endows us with significance through our close personal connection with the Father of Jesus, whom Jesus says is also our Father. And to rest, to enter into this place and rest in that embrace is to enter the secret place. I believe that to enter the secret place, we become as little children. We become spiritually vulnerable, like my heart was vulnerable in Israel, where I was aware of the spiritual significance of the places I was walking. And my heart, like a little child, realized I can do nothing of my own. That's what Jesus said. The son can do nothing of himself. He had the heart of a little child and that enabled him to dwell in the place of intimacy with the Father. And when we come to that place of being like little children, allowing our our hearts to become vulnerable, we begin to enter the secret place. That is the entry point. In fact, Paul tells us, if we can realise it with our hearts, that we are already there. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, he says that God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him, that is, with God, in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. When we joined in Jesus' resurrection, we were raised up with him to sit at Father's bosom in the corpus of God in Christ Jesus. And if Jesus has returned to his place of intimacy at the Father's bosom, that is where we are right now in the Spirit. There are so many things that seem to prevent us from dwelling there, from living there, from accessing and realising that we are already there. We, we fight to get in, we, we press in, we press on, we warfare, but, but what are the issues that really prevent us from resting in the corpus of our Father? What are the things that prevent us from dwelling in that embrace? I, I want to leave you with those questions. I want to ask you to ponder them. What is it that prevents me from resting in my Father's arms? What is it that prevents me from entering into that place in the folds of the Father's garments? And hopefully over time, we will get to cover some of the issues. If you continue to to tune into these, these podcasts, we will look at some of the issues that prevent us from resting in the secret place. Those issues which mean that we, we only occasionally visit and have a taste of what it is that Jesus died to give us. God bless you. I just want to pray. Father, I pray that you would begin to 
minister to each of our hearts, that we would learn to become little children with vulnerable hearts that know our need of your love. Father, that we would begin to access that secret place that Jesus has prepared for us at your bosom, where he himself dwells. Thank you, Father, that your love is eternal, that you're pouring your love upon us right now. Father, teach us how to dwell in this place. Amen. Thank you. God bless. See you again.